Hello and welcome to Classical Music on Mushrooms. This is a podcast where we explore all things unspoken in the classical music world. I'm excited to dive deep into taboo topics that are oftentimes shied away from or completely ignored in classical music spaces. So with that, let's get deep and have a good fucking time. Like I've said in my previous episode on Debussy, Liszt, and Chopin, I enjoy talking about composers like their people. I don't like putting people on pedestals, and I don't think that just because someone writes amazing music that they are somehow exempt from being discussed in this sort of way. In this episode, I will be discussing the life and accomplishments of Hildegard of Bingen, some of her fascinating writings, and strange practices in her convent that kind of resemble a cult. Yes, a cult. Now, if you don't know, I'm currently working towards my master's degree right now. And in one of my writing classes, I had the pleasure of researching Hildegard's life and works. But because my research paper was academic, I had to hold back on a lot of my saucy opinions and observations about her. You lucky people are getting my uncensored thoughts about Hildegard and her strange obsessions. So with that, let's get into talking about this fascinating historical figure. Hildegard was born around 1098 and died in 1179, and she is often the very first female composer mentioned in most music history textbooks. She wasn't just a composer, but also a prophetic visionary, abbess, and writer. She was recently granted sainthood by the Catholic Church in 2012. Now, this chick wrote a lot of music in her lifetime, the majority of them being chants organized into song cycles. However, her most famous work is a morality play set to music entitled Ordo Virtutum, or Play of Virtues. Google defines morality play as a kind of drama with personified abstract qualities as the main characters, and presenting a lesson about good conduct and character. The cool thing about Hildegard's play is that it was the first morality play published by over a hundred years, so Hildegard's a pretty innovative person. We're going to dive into this piece a little later and the drama in Hildegard's life that surrounded this piece. Stay tuned for that because it's very spicy. Oh, that reminds me. I forgot to tell you how hot you're looking today. Damn girl, you are just glowing. I can see you're taking hot girl summer very seriously. And if you're a rich virgin, Hildegard probably thinks you're hot too. (laughs) Anyways, back on track. Hildegard was the youngest of 10 children and was brought to a convent at the age of eight to begin her life as a nun. Guys, could you imagine being dropped off at a convent that young? I'm sure at the time it was normal, but from a modern perspective, I'm sure that must have been very traumatizing for her. Regardless, throughout her years, she was able to rise through the ranks and eventually ran her own convent in what is now modern Germany. Hildegard just had that bad bitch energy. She's just out here getting things done. I think one of the main reasons I gravitate towards Hildegard was her alleged psychic abilities. Y'all know I love supernatural shit. (laughs) Hildegard began having hallucinations at the age of three, but didn't start recording them until she was in her 30s. Researchers don't know exactly why she had these hallucinations, but some theories include chronic migraines or the ingestion of some unknown hallucinogenic. It took her 10 years to complete her theological book called Scivias. It was completed in 1141 and is the culmination of her recorded visions. Because of these writings, she was recognized for her wisdom as a prophet. Hildegard even corresponded with Pope Eugenius III regarding Scivias, and he declared the text to be God's truth and ordered her to record all of her visions from that day forward. I personally found a lot of these visions to be quite fascinating. And I'm a horror junkie, so I took interest in her descriptions of the devil in particular. I know, I'm weird, but so was Hildegard, apparently. Here's a short excerpt of her vision of the devil. Just a warning, the imagery is a little insane and is a little disturbing, but I'm into it, so here we go. The black hairy worm was full of sores and pus. It had five different areas on it, starting at the head and going down across its belly and right on down to its feet. These areas were green, white, red, yellow, and black. All five of these areas were full of deadly poison. 
The head of this worm was already trampled underfoot, that one could see that its left jawbone was broken. Its eyes looked bloodshot on the outside, but fiery on the inside. Its ears were round and hairy. Its nose and mouth looked like that of a snake. Its tail was short and horrible. There was a chain that had been placed around its neck, and which had also bound its feet and its hands. This chain was fastened firmly in the stone of the abyss, and it bound this worm so strongly that it could not move itself either here nor there, according to its own evil will. Many flames came from its mouth. The flame which rose right up to the clouds was fighting against the people who were angrily wishing for the heavens. Guys, isn't that so sick? I just found that so cool. I can imagine that scene coming straight from a horror movie. I hope you guys liked it too. <laughs> Maybe you understand why I read it now, because it's just... I don't know. I'm really into that stuff. So we also see Hildegard's fascination with the devil and his evil manipulative ways in her play of virtues that I mentioned earlier. In the story, the devil tempts a soul, also called anima, with his evil agenda. In the play of virtues, Hildegard warns that the devil attracts people who are eager to satisfy their passions, and those souls that succumb to his perversions are bound to death. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> so, in the play specifically, the devil is the only major role played by a man. Another interesting facet of the character is that the devil is the only character that doesn't sing. The devil could only speak because of his lack of connection to divinity. This is noteworthy because Hildegard viewed singing as a holy activity. The sacred act of singing meant the world to Hildegard, so naturally there's no way she would set the devil's dialogue to music. Along with Hildegard's fascination with the devil, I also found evidence of her fascination with femininity and virginity in both of her writings and music. 